G'day and welcome to this pocket money edition of Follow the Money. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. And tonight I'm in the press gallery with Chief Economist Richard Dennis and Senior Economist Matt Grudnoff, fresh from the budget lockup. This isn't a comprehensive discussion of Budget 2017, but we wanted to get you something quickly and we've tried to touch on some of the main items from tonight's budget, including the levy on the banks, which will raise a lot of money but could be passed straight on to consumers, the measures to tackle housing affordability, the magical creature at the heart of the budget, which Matt will talk about, and the good news that the government has finally agreed we have a revenue problem. Let's get straight into it. Mr Speaker, tonight... I announce a fair and responsible path back to a balanced budget. Look, it's uh, it's a good old-fashioned Labor budget, Uh, (laughs) although, of course, delivered by the Liberals, it comes with some unusual twists. (laughs) We've we've got taxes up, uh, we're spending more on schools. Uh, That said, of course, it's not a Labor budget, so what we also see is uh, the corporate tax cuts uh, still proposed to go ahead. So on the one hand, we've got a new levy tonight on the big banks. It's going to raise around $6 billion over four years. That's great. Uh, but, of course, the government wants to cut the company tax rate, which is going to deliver them around $7.4 billion over the same sort of period. So, you know, Morrison... Robert give the people. <laughs> oh, snakes and ladders. I was going to say the Treasurer giveth with one hand and taketh with the other. Um, and, and the other big thing, of course, is that how we can tell it's not really... Well, it's not a Labor budget, obviously. Well, we've introduced a 2% tax cut for the highest income earners. Yep. The deficit repair levy is gone, and everybody gets a 0.5% increase uh, in so their income tax. A- really high income earner, you're coming out much better in this budget and yep. everyone else is paying an increased Medicare levy. Correct. I can confirm tonight that the budget is projected to return to balance in 2021 and remain in surplus over the medium term. The budget papers predict that we will have a surplus in the fourth year and really at the heart of this budget is a unicorn, a magical creature that Scott Morrison <laughs> is desperate to believe in despite all evidence to the contrary and that unicorn is the wages growth unicorn. If wages grow faster, we get uh, more tax from income tax and essentially that's what uh, the budget papers assume is going to happen, that's what Scott Morrison assumes is going to happen and that's why we have a surplus in the fourth year. Now despite the fact that we have had record low wages growth for several years now, that is all about to change according to the uh, the Treasurer. It's all about to change and we are going to have record wages growth. A wages explosion is about to occur in this country. It's great to see that after four years we're still four years away from surplus. We always seem to be four years away from surplus. Every time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like all exotic meats taste like chicken <laughs> and all budgets are four years away from surplus. And as Matt said, we've got uh, some very optimistic forecasts in here about wage growth, which, you know, could be great news for workers. Is there anything in the budget that actually is going to deliver on that? Uh, No. Uh, There's a very strong forecast. (laughs) This is all forecast. This is all numbers that have come out of some treasury model. This has nothing to do with what's actually happening in the economy. And, of course, everything we've done in the labour market in the last 10 years has actually led to lower wages growth. We've we've deregulated the labour market, uh, union densities at an all-time low. We've cut penalty rates. We've just cut penalty rates. Uh, We've got Uh, you know a million people working as contractors many of whom we know are sham contractors we've got franchises that don't pay award wages got heaps of companies that aren't even paying super exactly so you know we've through deregulating the labor market through uh through weakening the regulatory and oversight structures so systematically over the last couple of decades the idea that at this point in history wages are going to turn around and surge through the roof Uh, I think the opposite is more likely. To ensure the NDIS is fully funded, we will legislate to increase the Medicare levy by 0.5 percentage points in two years' time when the extra bills start coming in. Is that really an acknowledgement or a really decisive repudiation, do you think, of the Abbott hockey horror budget? Oh, yes, and it gets better. They've, They've gotten rid of all of the zombie measures... So this really is attempting to bury and cremate that 2014 budget. Yeah. I'd go further. They're also burying Peter Costello's legacy. Peter Costello gave us the idea that the only way to create jobs was to cut taxes. Mm-hmm. Tonight, 
we heard that the Liberal Party thinks that collecting more revenue from new taxes is a good idea and that the way you create jobs is to spend money on infrastructure and services. Which so this is, is what the evidence suggests. Absolutely. But not what the ideology expects. We haven't just uh, buried the 2014 horror budget. We've actually buried 15 years of Liberal Party ideology. It's a, it's, it's a significant shift. Does that mean then that uh, Malcolm Turnbull's potentially delivered a budget that's going to be obviously far more politically popular than the 2014 horror budget but might cause him a problem internally within the Liberal Party? Yeah, look, the, the, the politics are more uh, complicated than the economic because on the one hand, uh, Turnbull's going to have to manage the right wing of his party, many of whom love the trickle-down stuff, but at the same time, he's still wide open to criticism by Labor that he's committed to a very expensive $50 billion corporate tax cut, that he's, he hasn't done anything about the housing crisis. In particular, he hasn't touched negative gearing or the capital gains tax. And, of course, he's given people earning more than $180,000 a year a tax cut while he's increasing taxes for everybody else. Tonight, I also announce a new six basis point levy on the big banks' liabilities starting on July 1. This measure will secure $6.2 billion over the budget and forward estimates to support budget repair. So the bank levy is basically a, a tiny percentage levy on the size of banks' loan book. So the value of their loans, a tiny percentage of that goes in tax. But it's limited to banks that are worth more than $100 billion. So effectively it's only the big four that will be paying this levy. And Macquarie Bank. And Macquarie Bank. The people's friend. We have also chosen, Mr Speaker, to put downward pressure on rising housing costs. There was a lot of talk about housing affordability in the lead up to budget. Has the Treasurer fixed it or squibbed it? Squibbed it. There were masses of policies, none of which will have almost any effect on housing at all. Indeed, I think there were eight separate policies, and I think even some of them will actually increase house prices, not decrease them. Yeah, they've come up with the list of policy measures you do to fix housing affordability when you don't want to do the measures that would fix housing affordability. So we've ruled out negative gearing, yep. we've ruled out capital gains tax and yep. discount, so this is what we're left with. The B team. The, <laughs> the housing package is all package and no housing. Oh, boom, boom. <laughs> to support growth, we choose to invest in building Australia, rail by rail, runway by runway and road by road. Well, it's good to see that the government has finally worked out that you can go into debt, particularly when interest rates are really low, to produce assets. And what the government's doing is they're spending about $75 billion on asset, most of which is rail. Most of it, I imagine, will run through regional National Party electorates, <laughs> which I'm sure is a complete coincidence. But it's good that we've moved away from this idea that all debt is bad. It would be good if, um, if the government was a bit more rigorous in how it uh, assessed what projects would get funded. And we really need to look at the detail of each of the projects. But at least from a big picture point of view, um, it's good to see that the government is embracing some debt. It's also good to see that Tony Abbott's 2014 idea of only funding road and not touching support for rail has mm. been repudiated as well. So uh, I think there's going to be at least one unhappy backbencher out there tonight. <laughs> I wanted to ask about Adani energy and climate change. We've had a couple of budgets. What? <laughs> what? what was that last one? Climate change. Climate change. Does that ring any bells? Sorry, I've been in the lockup for seven hours, <laughs> so I, I have I heard it mentioned no. Anyway, I, 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 yeah, that one's gone right past me with the which one? <laughs> <laughs> Anything on fixing our energy crisis? Yeah. Look, so the government came into the budget saying that housing and energy um, were its big issues. It squibbed both. Um, there's some new me measures in there on energy, but by and large, it's things we've already heard of: Snowy 2.0, some scoping stuff. Studies. There's no systematic attempt to fix either the energy crisis we had last summer or, of course, the climate crisis that we're confronting. Indeed, the budget papers do not mention the word climate change at any point. There, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of pages in the budget papers. Well, if it doesn't exist, why would you talk about it, Matt? Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> any other, I guess, surprises, anything else that we weren't expecting? In addition, we will commence a modest drug testing trial for 5,000 new welfare recipients and denying welfare for a disability caused solely 
by their own substance abuse. I'm surprised that a libertarian Liberal Party would be proposing random drug searches of welfare recipients. No mention of CEOs or sporting players or indeed politicians. Um, but yes, it seems the one group in, in Australia we want to keep our eye on for drug taking is the lowest income earners. Mr Speaker, this is a responsible budget. Above all, this is an honest budget. So, Richard, what's the big picture takeaway for you from this budget? So, we've got a tax cut for high income earners. People earning over $180,000 a year will no longer pay the deficit repair levy. Well, the it, deficit's fixed. Well, in four years it will. Uh, while, uh, while everybody is going to see uh, the Medicare levy go up by 0.5%. So it's a, it's a fundamental repudiation of what the government's been doing for its last four budgets. It's a massive change in direction, but tax cuts for high income earners, tax rises for everybody else, and it's still a $50 billion proposed cut in the corporate tax rate and a failure to do anything about housing, it's a big shift for the government, but I think they've left themselves some very big, uh, some very big weaknesses that Labor are likely to exploit. But it does sound like we've at least got an admission from the government that there is a revenue problem that it's been ignoring for years and years. Oh, fundamentally, at the heart of this budget is a six billion dollar tax on the big banks and an increase in income tax for everybody else. It's nice to see that the, the Liberal Party have finally come round to what we've been saying for years and years and years, and that is that this budget fundamentally has a revenue problem, not a spending problem, um, and, a, and they've now at least focused some of their attention on the revenue side. We just have to drag them a bit fair, further and make it a little bit fairer. Exactly right. Well, thanks very much for spending seven hours locked up with the budget papers. <laughs> Is that your idea of heaven, Matt? <laughs> Absolutely. Six hours trapped in a room with budget papers and a thousand journals. What could be better? <laughs> it's my happy place. That's been the Budget 2017 edition of Follow the Money, brought to you by the Australia Institute. You can sign up on tai.org.au to get our comprehensive budget analysis straight to your inbox. You can subscribe on iTunes or find previous episodes on the Australia Institute website at tai.org.au forward slash podcasts. And if you like Follow the Money, please rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps other people to discover the podcast. Richard Dennis's a book, Econobabble, very handy for analysing budgets, is available now from redbackquarterly.com.au or you can find it on Amazon and in all good bookshops. You can follow Richard on Twitter at RDNS underscore TAI. Matt is at Matt Grudnoff, G-R-U-D-N-O-F-F. I'm at Ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. And the Twitter handle for the Australia Institute is the Oz Institute with an A-U-S. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy. You can find her at Jennifer Macy, M-A-C-E-Y. And our title track is from Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.